we looked at the fact that there was just one choice in that situation, or two choices. Sometimes some people put it as two choices. That means I walk away or I stay. But both make us feel bad. Both makes our thinking just be negative and our actions be negative. Yes, you may go for therapy and stuff, eventually heal, but uh, life is tough that we have to go and deal with that all the time. All right? We want the human nature, I won't say the human mind, the human nature is that we must have something that sets us free. So the question comes up, how many choices do we truly have in that moment? We actually have infinite, infinite choices in every and any moment in life. If we choose not to categorize choice as good or bad, right or wrong, happy or sad. What the human mind does, it does that. It categorizes choice as happy or sad, right or wrong, good or bad. Why? Because it looks at what makes it feel comfortable and stays away from that which is uncomfortable. It makes us choose that which makes us feel safe and discards that which is unsafe. We need to recognize that we need to sometimes make uncomfortable, insecure, it may seem, choices. When I use the word insecure, I mean maybe makes us vulnerable. Why? It is necessary for our growth and learning. All right? We've heard of Elon Musk. He describes something very interesting. Someone asked him a question. What is the key to your success? And he gives a very interesting answer. He says, I have a high threshold for pain. Many of us, most of us generally recognize pain and we run in the opposite direction. The idea is to encompass all the choices that you have, all the possibilities, and allow not for a reaction to the situation, but a response. And the response is something that comes from the full conduit, the infinite possibilities and potentials that are out there, rather than choosing the same old instinctive reactive choice. So what happens if I draw it, is you've opened yourself up to the infinite choices that you have at your disposal. Alright? The eternal possibilities. And that way, you've opened yourself up to the universe of choice. I'll use other words. You could use your belief system, a, a, a faith and conviction in something more than your mind. A faith and conviction in maybe whatever you see it as, the universe, your gods, your ancestors. And what happens then, we allow that to conquer and control the mind. What happens then, you are buying into something more. The mind, we need to recognize, is a better servant than a master. You and I need to use the mind as a tool in our hands, not be a tool of the mind. We speak of the chemical imbalance in the brain. We need to shift that chemical imbalance by being in alignment with something more powerful than the mind. We need to be driven by something that is beyond the mind, which may appear absolutely illogical and irrational. Because the mind is the seat of logic and rationality. But right now, for example, to give you an example, uh, uh, situation we face, you and I have no clue about this COVID virus. It is completely illogical and irrational. Back in February 2020, if someone had said we'd all be walking around with masks and we were like laughed at them. If, we, if it was logical and rational, we all had bought container loads of masks and sold them. If you knew a year later we'll still be in the predicament, you would have still bought more and more masks. We are completely uncertain. We, we were speaking of first wave, who knew about second wave, third wave, if there's going to be a fourth wave, 
It's completely illogical, irrational, uncertain, insecure. In fact, this is a times of insecurity, uncertainty. And one might argue, no safety. The mind, no matter how logical and rational it is, and how powerful it is, has no clue how to deal with this situation. And what this demands, for example, this moment, is a faith and conviction in something far more than what the mind is. And in hindsight and retrospect, one day we will look back and say, you should have just done this or that. Or generations later will say, why didn't you just do this or that? Because it would, for them it will be logical and rational. For us, it's, at this stage, it's illogical and irrational. And by tapping into that more, you actually open your mind up to infinite destinies rather than the same old boring destiny. And the same old boring destiny is because of the using the same old pathway over and over again. We become like those hamsters on the wheel, running, running around in circles and wondering why there's no shift in our lives. Because we follow the same pathways in our brain. We fire and wire the same pathway. But by tying into something more, we allow the mind to be aligned with something far more powerful. And something more doesn't mean it has to be beyond yourself. So where it has to come from is a space of selflessness. It cannot come from the space of selfishness. Because the mind itself is probably the most selfish entity amongst us. Because it is completely geared to keeping us safe. And it keeps us safe sometimes, lots of times, at the expense of anyone and everyone else. Selflessness means you need to step beyond the mind. So I'll give you a story, something very interesting. Uh, my son was doing a project on the Titanic. Okay? And if you know the story of the Titanic, it was a ship, the biggest ship at the time, that was taking passengers from Southampton across to the States. And it hit an iceberg, and it had too few uh, lifeboats. And they recognized this was going to be a problem, right? Because it was going to sink, in spite of the fact that it was apparently a ship that was not going to you know, sink at all. It had been designed with the latest technology of the time but it had a huge gash along the side, so it, it was inevitable that it was going to sink. And there, everyone on the ship could not be accommodated on these life lifeboats. And a decision had to be made as to how to save people. And something very interesting, a statement came up, was that women and children first. And they were, women and children were first loaded on the lifeboats. And there were some that got onto the lifeboats, even though they were men. Yes, they had a crewman that would navigate the boat, but there were some men who also got on the boat. Why? Because for them, self-preservation, protection was important. Their minds took over. Because we all head out the door and want to get out on those boats if we can. And it demanded a high level of selflessness to say, at some level it did. I will stay on the ship because it is instinctive that you want to survive. Human behaviors will survive. As we said, if a lion comes to this door, we'll be out. No one said, I'll wait for the women and children to leave. Okay, there's not, you know what I mean? But we'll be out of here. All right? So it was a selfless decision and something aligned with something more. It was about giving, not about how much the mind got. It had to be something far more powerful. And that allows the mind to be at rest. What you have done is allowed the mind to take its actual space, space and place, which is a servant, some might argue, to your spirit, your soul, to a greater purpose, greater meaning, greater truth. And that way, what it does as well is allows you not to go down the fight, flight, fright pathway, which is a primitive, instinctive pathway. We actually align with a pathway so much more powerful. We then become truly authentic because then we fit in, we balance in with something more than what we are. 
why we are here at the moment is that the mind, we have put it up there, but it does not give us the solution to the problems we're facing. And human nature, we have not allowed the mind to step back. We still say, I think, therefore I am. So you may say, I think I'm depressed, therefore I am depressed. I think I'm anxious, therefore I am anxious. But why not let's twist that whole statement around and say, I am, therefore I think. And you and I can be anything and everything we want to be rather than the outcome of what we think. So there's a statement even, begin with the end in mind. Along the lines of recognize where we want to go, what we want to be, rather than what the mind says we should think and be. We have to have something, a faith in, a, in something that may seem nonsensical, illogical and irrational. And what's amazing is that as much as we're talking from a psychiatry perspective, you hear of entrepreneurs who came up with ideas which may have originally seemed illogical and irrational and sometimes may have been described as crazy and dumb and stupid and eventually it manifests. What happens then is they had to have a faith, a conviction in something beyond what is logical and rational. And what happens is that the world, the universe seems to align with their thinking and allows a new way of being. For example, the one example I use generally is of Orville and Wilbur Wright, the Wright brothers who decided to fly in 1904. It was completely illogical and irrational. The mind, if someone says you want to fly off the ground back then, you'll probably be admitted to a facility. But they did it for 12 seconds. They got this plane off the ground. It's, the moment they did it, it wasn't logical and rational because eventually we worked out the logic and rationality of the concept of how a plane flies. Right? And in the same way, one day, uh, at the moment, logically and rationally, if someone says, I want to walk on the water of the swimming pool, you figure out why they're here, okay? And you better keep them far from the pool, right? But 20, 30, 40 odd years, who knows? I'm not sure if it'll ever happen. Your kids come up to you and say, Mom, Dad, today we learned how to walk on water. It's a two-line mathematical formula. And you say, that can never be. You say, oh, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. In the same way, we all carry these metal objects in our pockets that 30, 40 odd years ago would have been completely illogical and irrational. What we need to do is develop a faith and conviction. But it doesn't mean just having faith and conviction and imagination. Yes, we walk on water. You have to do the work that builds up to that level. Not asking you to walk on water, but we all want to achieve something that at this moment in time seems like walking on water. And for us, walking on water at this particular time is just being happy, just being fulfilled, just being blissful. It seems so scarce, so far away in the distance. However, we need to grasp it, hold on to it, believe it more than anyone else and make that part of our reality rather than what we're holding on to at the moment. Because what we're holding on to is just pain, hurt and suffering. And we need to let it go. We, can, we, we stagnated and we're allowing ourselves to be stuck there. And we're looking for the mind to solution. The mind doesn't, cannot give us a solution to this problem. We need to use the mind as a tool for the solution to the problem. The mind, we need to regard it as a pen that will write it down. The pen is not the solution. We need to use the mind as a tool. Because in one way of saying this, as much as we recognize that you're not the body, you're also not the mind. You are more than the mind and the body. The mind and the body are fundamentally within our control. You and I are beyond our mind, beyond our body. We tap into something far more than the body and the mind. And by doing that, we allow ourselves to be aligned with something far more. Right? And if you think of so-called great people, and we have a few in the country, or we have a few, Mandela, uh, Mother Teresa, whoever it is in the world, they all tapped into something far more. They did not necessarily just follow the logical and rational, comfortable process of life. They believed in something far more. 
which at the time seemed illogical and irrational. So I'll share this story with you. I was fortunate enough to have met Ahmed Katrala, who was in the cell next door to Mandela. And I asked him a question. What, as we were chatting, and he was like, oh, you're a psychiatrist. I'm like, yeah, I am, right? And, uh, but I, and so I asked him a question. Did they try and break you physically, mentally, and emotionally while you were in jail? And he gave me a, a very, I thought, powerful answer. He says, they didn't just try to break us physically, mentally, and emotionally. They also tried to break us spiritually. And you can just imagine the level of torture they went through for 20, over 20 years as a result. So he says, they didn't just try and break us physically, mentally, emotionally. They tried to break us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And then he said, but we were always, always optimistic that we will be free. They held on to a belief, a conviction, a faith that at the time was not logical, was not rational. In the 70s, you didn't even see a picture of Mandela. You had no clue what he looked like. In fact, when he left jail, oh, this is what he looks like. We had only these old black and white pictures of them. We had no clue what it will look like. Yet they held on to a belief and optimism as to their future. And something far more important I felt than he said, he says, we are always optimistic, we will be free. And then he added something more. He says, but we did not even believe that one day Mandela will be sitting in the office as a president and I will be sitting next to him. They gave a lot to the country. They gave their lives, many of them. They gave at a physical level, mentally level, emotional level, and you will say at a spiritual level. They gave because 27 years of their life is life, a spirit. When you give at that level, the universe rewards you more than you can possibly believe logically and rationally. It was even beyond their belief. What happens is, it's about going beyond the mind. Because Mandela, for example, could have been very comfortable, safe, secure, as a lawyer in Commissioner Street, running the practice Mandela, Susulu and Associates. He would have lived a life that the mind would have said, is okay, it's appeasable. You got all the comforts of life. You got the cars, you got the suits. They even described that he didn't drink, but he had alcohol you know, in his cabinet at home. However, he gave that up for something more, to achieve something beyond the mind. And we may say, oh, he was rewarded, but it wasn't about, interestingly enough, what is reward? What is the opposite of reward? It's responsibility. He took on the responsibility of an entire country's future. And the reward, maybe some would argue, of being president didn't really matter to him. What we need to recognize is you and I need to take responsibility for who we are, of our minds, and some would argue, of everyone else. And that will allow ourselves to be truly, truly free. Rather than responsibility, though, many of us resort to blame and thereby we end up victims of persons, people, situations and circumstances. We need to shift to a space where we take responsibility for ourselves and responsibility for everyone on this planet. And you may ask, how do I take responsibility for everyone else? because we struggle sometimes to just take responsibility for ourselves. Responsibility does not equate to control. Responsibility means being aware of how people will behave in different situations, different circumstances, and using that awareness to determine the way forward. How do you become aware? Awareness is about being aware of yourself, 
as an individual and thereby that facilitates awareness of others. By being aware of others, you also allow yourself to be aware of yourself. And what you and I need to do is go into a deeper space, understand who we are and where we're coming from, what makes us what we are. And why we don't do that is we need to recognize what's good about ourselves, which is easy, but also what's bad about ourselves. What are the good qualities about ourselves and what are the bad qualities? What is right about us and what is wrong about us? And that allows us to get more aligned with who we truly are. And recognizing the good and the bad, the right and the wrong, allows us to recognize our strengths and weaknesses and endeavor to something far, far, far more. And that will allow us to achieve more. And then you are more aware of yourself and you know when to hold yourself back and when to take yourself forward. When you may be in the wrong and when you may be in the right. When you're being good and when you're bad. But that introspection, that reflection, that contemplation allows us to go deeper within ourselves and that allows us to achieve higher. As deep as we go, as high as we can achieve. And that way we change who we are. Because being here is about fundamentally changing our thoughts, our feelings, our actions. And that is an internal process. And I say to you, all of us in here can achieve the most absolute possibilities. But the biggest person you have to convince as to achieving that is yourselves, ourselves. And you have to set the goals to the stars. And if you set the goals to the stars, even if you land on the moon, at least you got out of the planet you're in. But that then involves, as I was saying, a deep contemplation, reflection, introspection into who we are. And in spite of the good and bad, the right and wrong, you set a goal that's powerful. Not selfish, as in just for me, but for the world. And that allows you to become a conduit to energy that flows through the world into you and to facilitate a shift. What we generally do is we allow the energy to flow into us, but we block it off and keep it to ourselves and behave selfishly, arrogantly, obnoxiously. The idea is to allow the energy to flow through and let it manifest and express out there. And that way we set ourselves free of the depression, the anger, the hurt, the sorrow. It is a process. It's not going to happen overnight. But it's a process nonetheless. And yes, you will still experience emotions, be it positive or negative, be it anger or frustration or irritation, but you know that the anger, frustration and irritation then is more in keeping with a greater goal or purpose, not a goal of self-preservation. Because if we're born, you might as well, as much as you may preserve yourself, be it one way or the other, use up this body, this mind, in the achievement of something worthwhile. Because you and I are not meant to live in the shadow of the mind. It was never meant to be that kind of entity. I know we reward people who utilize their minds, as in degrees, affirmations, acknowledgements, or rewards. But that societal determination, society decided, the community decided, wow, However, you are more than that. Because the greatest leaders that we recognize in nowadays, we speak about it, is not the one who's got the most intelligence. It's about at a, a cognitive level, at a mental level. We now speak of what? Emotional intelligence. There's even books now of spiritual intelligence. And emotional intelligence may not suggest, doesn't suggest uh, uh, your IQ. It suggests something more. And if we hear, we all are struggling with our emotions. And that's what we want to let have control over. Rather than the intellect, that uh, cognitive ability doesn't set us free. It still keeps us prisoner to these feelings and emotions. And you and I need to build it to a level that it allows us to persevere in this world, to be resilient in spite of the circumstances, situations, persons and people we face. So what you and I need to do is do that exercise, go deep within, journalize, write, contemplate, reflect, meditate, some would say, and allow a manifestation and expression of something so much more powerful 
so much stronger than what our minds are. And thereby, by endeavoring to do that, what you and I will do is then the mind then becomes a tool we utilize. Not being utilized by the mind as a tool, the other way around. And thereby we set ourselves free. Then we truly at play in the world. And that way we truly conquer the mind and control the mind. We need to learn to control the mind. We need to conquer the mind like a lion grabs a goat by its neck. It holds on tight, it never lets go. You and I need to control the mind, not be controlled by the mind. And thereby, we truly, truly set ourselves free.